It being 2pm, we will move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham, you're seeking the call. I do have, uh, can I seek leave to make a statement regarding a ministerial absence? Oh, please go ahead, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Thursday 10 February 2022, for medical reasons. In Senator Reynolds' absence, Senator Rustin will represent the Minister for Government Services and the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Education and Youth. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Now we will move to questions. Senator Keneally. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Former New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian has said that, and I quote, all four of my grandparents were orphaned and witnessed untold atrocities against the Armenian people in 1915. More than 40 of her relatives were killed. Nine newspapers reported on the weekend that staff in the Prime Minister's office referred disparagingly to the New South Wales former Premier Gladys Berejiklian as Anne Frank. Why is the Prime Minister's office using Anne Frank's name to disparage Gladys Berejiklian? Uh, Minister, uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, I have not heard of those allegations, and I did not see uh, the story to which Senator Keneally refers in relation to those allegations. The Prime Minister has made very clear the utmost respect and regard that he has for Ms. Berejiklian. Uh, as is well known, he would have loved, indeed, for her to be a candidate uh, for uh, uh, for uh, this Parliament. Uh, we would have welcomed that particular former New South Wales Premier uh, to enter the House of Representatives, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President. We would have welcomed that particular New South Wales Premier to enter the House of Representatives, uh, Mr., uh, Mr President. Uh, and the Prime Minister has been very clear in relation to his, to his very high regard for her, uh, and I am confident uh, that he would have no tolerance for any such uh, references were they to be made in any place. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Has the Prime Minister ever referred to Ms Berejiklian as Anne Frank? Has the Prime Minister determined who in his office referred to Ms Berejiklian as Anne Frank? And will the Prime Minister apologise for his office using Anne Frank's name as an insult to Gladys Berejiklian? Minister. Oh, Mr President, as I just indicated, uh, the Prime Minister, I am confident, would have no tolerance for such references in any way. I am completely confident that he would never have made them and that he has such zero tolerance. As I said, I haven't seen the allegations and forgive me for the fact that I don't take everything in the way it's framed in questions from the opposition uh, as being presented at face value. because. I've learnt uh, in this job over time uh, that the distortions in terms Order. of the way questions can be presented uh, often uh, add a tone of misrepresentation uh, to what is apparently uh, having occurred. But the Prime Minister's respect for Ms Berejiklian is paramount, is significant, is held in the highest regard, uh, and Mr President, uh, his intolerance for such references or statements would equally be a high. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. A Notice she didn't rule out that his office had done it. The Prime Minister's office backgrounded against the loved ones of Ms Brittany Higgins. Then a veiled threat was made against Ms Grace Tame. And now we learn the Prime Minister's office uses Anne Frank's name as an insult to Gladys Berejiklian. You have not ruled that out. Order. What is going on inside the Prime Minister's office? Order. 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 Minister. Mr President, just because Senator Keneally says it doesn't mean it's true. Just because Senator Keneally picks up the mud bucket and throws it around doesn't mean there's any accuracy to it. Mr President, these opposite, those opposite are demonstrating, as they do time and time again, question time after question time, they're only interested in character assassination. They're only interested in making it a personality contest 
They're not interested in policies. You know, as we've highlighted in this place, they come in here, they sling mud at Senator Colbeck, but they never propose an alternate aged care policy, do they? No, no, they never do that, of course. They are an opposition bereft of any ideas, bereft of any direction, bereft of any substance, with a leader who flip-flops and policies depending Order. on where they're at, with a, an opposition Order. who came up with $81 billion of extra spending ideas during the course of the pandemic, but then say we should have budget repair. Minister. They demonstrate they've just Minister. got no idea. Minister. Thank you. Before we move on, Senator Patterson, I would just like to draw attention of honourable senators to the presence in the gallery of the Minister for Health for Papua New Guinea, the Honourable Jelta Wong, and the High Commissioner for Papua New Guinea to Australia, His Excellency John Carley. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome to the Parliament and, in particular, to the Senate. Senator Patterson. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the visits to Australia by our key partners this week and broader engagement by the Liberal and Nationals government to promote an Indo-Pacific region that is stable, secure and prosperous? I call the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his question and for his deep interest in these key strategic issues. Under this coalition government, Australia is working with our partners to advance our values and shared interests. This week, in fact, brings engagements with eight of my foreign minister counterparts. Tomorrow, the Quad foreign ministers meeting with India, the United States and Japan will take place in Melbourne. With External Affairs Minister Jayshankar, Foreign Minister Hayashi and US Secretary of State Blinken, Australia continues to pursue an agenda for a free and open Indo-Pacific through ambitious, practical cooperation. The Quad follows a visit by my Lithuanian counterpart, Foreign Affairs Minister Lance Burgess, with whom I had very productive discussions yesterday on our responses to major security and trade challenges. Today, I've met with Timor-Leste's Foreign Affairs and Cooperation Minister, Adeliza Mengo, and we discussed our shared COVID-19 response, vaccines and labour mobility. This week, we've also had a four-way virtual call with Minister Magno and our counterparts from Indonesia and New Zealand, Ministers Masudi and Mahuta. Four female foreign ministers in our region sends a very powerful message, Mr President. We discussed advocacy and action on the women, peace and security agenda, and, and once again I expressed Australia's strong support for the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Today, I also met with my friend, Papua New Guinea's Health Minister, Jolta Wong, and I also acknowledge Jolta in the chamber today. Minister Wong and I particularly just reinforced Australia's commitment in our discussions to partnering with Papua New Guinea on our shared COVID-19 response and recovery. All of our partners, Mr President, are committed to building a free and open region, deeply engaging with a range of partners to support our vision for an open, prosperous and secure Indo-Pacific. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate on the positive agenda for the Quad Foreign, Me Foreign Minister's meeting with India, Japan and the United States tomorrow? Minister. Mr President, our four countries share a commitment to building a free and open Indo-Pacific, and we are cooperating to support that goal. Most critical is the COVID response. I'm pleased to report that the Quad has now delivered more than 500 million vaccines under our 1.3 billion dose commitment. We will also discuss further cooperation to defend against malicious cyber attacks and dangerous disinformation, to enhance maritime security in our region, to support infrastructure development, to enhance climate action by working together on clean energy supply chains, and to assist our Indo-Pacific partners when they face crises, such as the volcanic eruption and tsunami that so recently devastated Tonga. The Quad agenda is positive and it's practical. It works alongside our other relationships, including importantly with ASEAN, which, founded in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, lies at the heart of the Indo-Pacific. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Will the Minister advise the Senate on upcoming opportunities to further advance Australia's vision of an open and resilient Indo-Pacific? Minister. Mr President, 
Australia is promoting and supporting our shared vision for the Indo-Pacific region, including through cooperation with partners like the United Kingdom and Europe. Late last month, Minister Dutton and I hosted the Australia-United Kingdom ministerial consultations in Sydney. We had substantive discussions about deepening strategic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and secured new agreements with the United Kingdom on cyber cooperation and sustainable infrastructure investment in the Indo-Pacific. This follows my meetings in December at the G7 in Liverpool with the world's most influential liberal democracies and meetings with and visits to counterparts in Greece, the European Union, uh, in Belgium and in Austria. This month, I'll attend the Munich Security Conference in Germany and the European Union Ministerial Forum for Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in Paris. These discussions underline Australia's commitment to cooperation with the EU and other like-minded countries in support of the rules-based order. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Minister Colbeck. Minister, the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics Selected Living Costs Index was released last week. By how much has the cost of living gone up for age pensioners in Australia over the last calendar year? The, the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank the Senator for the question. Uh, Senator, I don't have a brief with me on the CPI increase um, for uh, senior Australians. I'm sorry, I can't give that. I'll commit to come back to you at the end of question time with the data. Senator Sheldon. A Minister, supplementary question. If the December quarter 2021 is 3.4%, do these latest statistics show that the highest annual increase to the cost of living is being inflicted on aged pensioners, or have we conveniently forgotten to bring your homework today? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the, the government has continued to support senior Australians through a number of measures over the course of recent times, including through specific and special payments to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. We've put a number of measures in place to support individuals who might be isolated in their homes during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and I reject any assertion at all uh, that we have left any part of the community behind. We have worked as a government throughout the entire uh, period of the pandemic and uh, to ensure that there are additional resources available available for people to help them meet the cost of living. We've put supplements in respect of the pension in place, Mr President. We've put supplements in, pl Minister, in place. please resume your seat. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, direct relevance. Um, the question was fairly tightly worded and specific as to whether or not there were the highest annual increases to the cost of living being inflicted on aged pensioners. The minister hasn't addressed that aspect of the question. I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to bring the minister back to the question. However, the question did involve uh, some commentary in the asking of the question, uh, which quite frankly does mean the question is not worded quite as narrowly as you say, Senator Keneally. Uh, I've allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. Uh, minister, you have the call for 15 seconds. Mr. President, uh, uh, the government has, or the, the process that, that the government supports, and I'm presuming that the opposition supports, has continued to support the increase in pensions on, the, on a regular cycle. Uh, and so, Mr. President, I don't accept the premise. I don't. I don't accept Minister, the premise, Mr. Minister, President, that Minister, uh, your time the government's left has pensions behind. Expired. Senator Sheldon, a second supplementary question. With the cost of living for aged pensioners going up for food, housing, and transport. What is the minister doing in his role as Minister for Senior Australians to ensure they can get by? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. As I was just indicating, there is a regular cycle of pension increases which take into account the impacts of the CPI uh, as, as a part of the, the pension increase process. And as I said earlier, Mr President, during COVID, 
uh, during COVID, Mr. President, we've put additional payments in place to support uh, senior Australians and pensioners to help them support support them through uh, the COVID pandemic, Mr. President. So, uh, I acknowledge the comments that uh, Senator Sheldon is making in relation to the, the recent CPI increases, but those things are taken into account in the in the regular CPI increases uh, that are undertaken for the pension. Um, they, the pension rates increased on the 20th of September by $14.80 for singles and $22.40 for couples demand, uh, combined, and new maximum fortnightly, fortnightly rates, uh, including uh, pension supplement and energy supplements, uh, 967.50 for singles and 1458.60 for couples. I have Senator Wish Wilson next on the list. I'm going to you, Senator Rice. Is yes. that correct? <laughs> Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Attorney General. Minister, I just read this headline from the ABC. Government shelves religious freedom bill indefinitely. Can you confirm that you no longer plan to bring on the religious discrimination bills for debate in the Senate before the election? The Attorney General. Minister Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Senator Rice, and thank you for your question uh, on the very important topic of protecting Australians um, from discrimination on the basis of their religion. Uh, the bill actually passed the House of Representatives last night, the Religious Discrimination Bill. It passed with the government amendments. But in relation to another bill, Senator Rice, which Adam Band voted for, changes to the Sex Discrimination Act. Mr President, do you know what happens when you rush something and you don't potentially Order. consider the consequences? Order. Senator Rice, you can Order make mistakes. You can make mistakes. And Mr President, I have Order. been overwhelmed with calls this morning regarding Order. the impact of the amendments passed last Minister, night. Minister. No, I'm not going to give you the call until there's silence in the chamber. Senator Rice. Um, President, um, point of order on relevance. My question was very succinct and very direct as to whether the religious discrimination bill would be brought on for debate in the Senate before the election. I listened to your question, Senator Rice. I'm listening to the Minister's answer. I believe the Minister is being relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much. And Mr President, as I said, the Morrison government, the Morrison-Joyce government, takes the issues of discrimination very seriously in Australia. We are committed to protecting Australians of faith and those not of faith from discrimination on the basis of their religion. And as I said, the bill passed the House of Representatives last night. We made a commitment to the Australian people that we Order. would, on this issue, address it at the last election. And Senator Rice, we are progressing that commitment. Order. But when amendments passed the House of Representatives, supported by the right of Labor, that have the potential impact of actually increasing the discrimination Order. and the grounds of discrimination that can actually be now against Order. students. Mr President, we take that Minister, serious... Minister, your time has expired. Senator Watt. Senator, Senator Rice, I have not given you the call. It needs to be quiet in the chamber. Order. Order on my right. Order. Senator Rice, you have the call for a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your non-answer to my question. We are still in the dark as to whether the government will bring on the bill. Minister, the, the media is full of headlines, bill on ice, indefinitely delayed, will not proceed. Minister, given that, and it seems that it's, you know, I take that it's not going to proceed, why won't you take, commit to taking meaningful action to protect people of faith rather than this sham bill that was the rushed product of right-wing culture wars? Minister. Well, Senator Rice, you see, this is the fundamental difference between the Australian Greens 
and those in the coalition side of the government. You see, we believe in protecting people of faith from discrimination. And we made a commitment to the Australian people. We Order. consulted widely, Mr President, across the board, and we presented to the parliament what was a fair and reasonable bill. It honoured our commitment to people Order. of faith to protect them from discrimination Senator on the Rice. basis of their religion. Senator, Senator Rice, Rice, do you think it is fair that a Muslim should be discriminated against in employment? Do you think it is fair, do you? Do you think it is fair that a Sikh should be discriminated against in Senator employment? Pratt. Do you think it is fair? Senator Mc Order. Order. Senator McKim, on a point of order. Thank you, President. On a, on a point of order, the answer to those questions, of course, is no. But I draw to your attention, uh, President, that remarks should be directed to the chair, not to, uh, in the form of questions, directly uh, to other senators. But the answer, Fair. for what it's worth, is no. Senator McKim, there is no point of order. Minister, you have five seconds remaining if you wish to take them. Absolutely. Again. On this side of politics, we believe in protecting people of faith Minister, from discrimination based Minister, on that Minister, faith. Senator Order. Senator Rice, a second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, do you think that transgender diverse and non-binary people, including students at school, deserve the same protection from discrimination as other people, including by not having their very identity challenged and undermined by hurtful transphobic speech? Minister. Well, Mr President, again, the Morrison-Joyce government has made its position very, very Clear. Yes, we have, Senator Rice. And if you Order. actually, Senator Rice, believed in protections, you would have read the amendment that passed the House of Representatives last night. There are very, very serious potential consequences for Section 38 and 37 of the Sex Discrimination Act because of the way it is drafted. Do you know what it has the effect of, Mr President? potentially increasing the grounds of discrimination against students and against prospective students. Order. 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 Senator Watt. Order. Senator Rice, on a point of order. A point of order again with relevance. My question was whether transgender diverse and non-binary people, including students at school, include, deserve the same protection from discrimination. I was listening to the minister's answer, and I believe she was being relevant to the question. Minister, you have 16 seconds remaining. Let me be very, very, very clear about the potential impact of the amendment that you supported last night. It seeks to protect students on the basis of gender identity, it leaves out the protections for those in the intersex community. This is why you need Minister, to properly understand Minister, the Minister, consequences Minister. of amendments that you make. Senator Walsh. Order Thank you, on President. My left. Order. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Does the government collect data on how many shifts in aged care in Australia are going unfilled each week? If yes, what is that number? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. No, the, the government doesn't collect individual facility shift data. Um, I don't think that is a, de a level of detail uh, that uh, we should go to. Or Mr President, as, I, as I've indicated, uh, to the chamber recently, we do some a calcula We do ha have done some calculation of the number of shifts that we, uh, that we believe might or not might um, might not be being filled, based on the number of uh, staff that um, uh, have con have had COVID, Mr. President. And so, uh, based on uh, some information as of the 4th of February, uh, for affected facilities. 
we believe the accumula uh, cumulative infection rate is nearly 30, 13 per cent um, of the uh, workforce on average and just over 5 per cent concurrently. So uh, that's, that relates to uh, the impact on facilities of uh, COVID-19 and therefore the shifts that are, that are being filled, particularly in relation to COVID. Sen order. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Peak body, the Australian Aged Care Collaboration found up to 140,000 shifts were not being filled each week. Can the minister confirm that at best the surge workforce is filling 0.7 per cent, less than 1 per cent of unfilled aged care shifts each week? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, the surge workforce was not designed to fill every unfilled shift in aged care oh, during COVID, Mr President. It wasn't oh, designed da. to do that. Um, and, Mr President, the, the advice that the government provided oh, to aged care providers right at the, back at, at the beginning of the pandemic was that they would be required to have a, some capacity in the cells to manage vacancies Minister. In, and shift. Senator Watt, on Thank, a point of order. Thanks. On relevance, Mr President. The question was a factual one and was going to the percentage of uh, unfilled shifts that the surge workforce is filling. That was the question, not the policy rationale or anything else like that. We'd just like a factual answer to that factual question. S Senator. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, on the uh, on the point of order, as uh, as you have ruled and uh, and your predecessors have ruled regularly, uh, it is not uh, it is not for the chair to determine precisely how a question should be answered. It is the chair order. to uphold the standing orders in terms of the direct relevance uh, of uh, of an answer, uh, and of course that direct relevance uh, can go to uh, the type of policy considerations and other things. Uh, uh, Senator order. Watt has said would not be relevant. It is not the case that uh, just because a question asks for a particular number that other relevant policy and issues associated with such data or facts would not also be directly relevant. Clearly, they would be. Uh, I've been listening to the minister's answer. I believe he was being directly relevant to the question. The minister has 39 seconds remaining. I call the minister. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, and it does relate specifically to the question because the inference is that the surge workforce should fill all shifts that uh, aren't being filled. And that's not what the surge workforce was designed to fill, Mr President. In the advice to the sector provided early in the pandemic, providers themselves were required to have capacity to fill a certain proportion of shifts themselves. Uh, Mr. President, and we have said where that, that capacity became overwhelmed, we would come in and support them with the surge workforce. And that's what we've done, Mr. President. That's what we've done, and we've continued to build the, the surge workforce to assist the sector to manage COVID-19 and their workforce shortages. Senator Walsh, a second supplementary. When 140,000 shifts in aged care are going unfilled, does the minister think providing 1,000 shifts is him performing exceptionally well? And when this minister continues to refuse to accept the aged care sector he is responsible for is in crisis, something even Mr Morrison has accepted, when will he resign? Minister. Uh, can I thank you and can I say what, what a completely incoherent question. I mean, Mr, Mr. President, ta ta again, Labor dishonestly taking out of context comments that I make about the performance of the sector versus, b b b versus uh, the, the circumstance with respect to filling of, of shifts through the surge workforce. And as I said in my uh, previous answer, Mr. President, the surge workforce was not designed, never was designed, to fill every vacant shift in residential aged care during COVID. It was there to provide assistance to providers who weren't able to fill Order. specific shifts in certain circumstances of extreme, um, uh, extreme need, Mr President. That's what we've done. Over 80,000 shifts we've provided support for, Mr President. We've continued to build that capacity uh, as we've uh, been able to and put additional resources towards it, and we will continue to support the sector as they work their way through the pandemic. We will now go to Senator Hanson remotely. Senator Hanson, you have the call. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In the event the coalition is returned to government at this year's federal election, will the Prime Minister commit to establishing a Royal Commission into the management of the COVID-19 pandemic by Australian governments? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank Senator Hanson um, for her question. It, uh, it is a very similar question to uh, to one that I uh, answered or addressed yesterday or the day before um, in relation to the types of reviews that uh, that could be undertaken. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear that uh, that uh, right now, in the here and now, uh, the government's priority remains on response to the pandemic, uh, and in responding to the pandemic, uh, Australia. Uh, working together, Commonwealth government, state and territory governments, uh, business community, health experts and, uh, and service providers in particular uh, have all managed to achieve some outstanding outcomes in comparison to the rest of the world, uh, that across Australia we uh, retain one of the lowest fatality rates and one of the highest vaccination rates uh, and some of the strongest economic outcomes. And, uh, they have all been uh, very important hard fought for outcomes that, uh, that Australians as a whole have contributed to and have responded to all of those messages. But the Prime Minister also acknowledged that there will, Senator Hanson, be uh, time uh, for appropriate uh, reviews and inquiries to look at the management of COVID-19. Uh, of course, we have had in this chamber an ongoing review process through the COVID Select Committee that was established, uh, but I'm sure there will be processes that look back. Uh, once we can put the pandemic more clearly in the rearview mirror. Uh, Senator Hanson, the exact nature of such reviews and inquiries would be matters uh, to be discussed with states and territories and others at the time. And whilst it will be important to have a look at preparedness and readiness for the handling of future crises and other uncertainties and what has gone right or wrong, I would, as I did in the response the other day, also just caveat that uh, with the fact that the next pandemic, the next crisis will be quite different, no doubt, to this one. And so while there will be lessons to be learned, we shouldn't pretend that anything will always provide preparation for all of the uncertainties Minister. we may face. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question? Thank you. The Prime Minister has consistently stated he does not support mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations, but did not support my COVID-19 vaccination discrimination bill. Why hasn't the Prime Minister introduced government legislation to give effect to his position and override state and territory vaccine mandates? Minister. Order. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Um, well, and the response to that in part is contained within uh, your question there, Senator Hanson, and that is that we are uh, not about to uh, introduce legislation to override uh, the states and territories uh, in these matters. Uh, we have supported uh, vaccine mandates only in the most limited of circumstances, uh, as Senator, uh, Senator Colbeck and others have, uh, have worked through, and those limited circumstances being for high-risk settings such as aged care. Beyond that, uh, we have strongly encouraged all Australians to get vaccinated, and more than 94 per cent uh, have responded by being double-dose vaccinated. We have strongly encouraged people to have the third-dose booster and many millions have responded by receiving the third dose booster. But the decisions of state and territory governments to apply their own mandates in different circumstances are matters between them and their electorates. Uh, and of course, it is for parties, oppositions and people to make their own determinations in those states Minister. and territories. Senator Hanson, a second supplementary. Um, Minister, you just didn't um, encourage people to have them. You actually complied with the states to force the people to have it. Otherwise, they would lose their jobs and positions and not be allowed into hospitals and doctors or stadiums or pubs or clubs. So if the Prime Minister will not introduce legislation, what measures will he implement to end COVID-19 vaccine discrimination in Australia and allow millions of citizens the rights and freedoms to which they are entitled? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Hanson, uh, as I said, these are state and territory mandates. They differ across different states and territories. They're decisions taken uh, under the uh, constitutional powers of the states and territories through their public health and emergency orders uh, using state and territory laws. Uh, we're not uh, in the business of routinely seeking to 
override all state and territory laws and powers or be the arbiter of what is right or wrong in every state and territory. They have to stand and account for themselves. Uh, they are each democratically elected governments. They each have an opposition and other political representatives uh, in their state or territory. Uh, and they are the right places to debate uh, the laws and the approaches of those states or territories. Our government has taken a different approach. We have not believed that widespread mandates are necessary except in the most exceptional of circumstances. We have been clear and consistent about that uh, and our encouragement of Australians to voluntarily get vaccinated has helped to achieve some of the best vaccine outcomes in Minister, the world, which is helping to keep Australia safe. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Molan. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And my question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. With the Director General of Security's annual threat assessment speech yesterday, can you please update the, uh, the Senate on how our security environment has changed in recent times? The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Molan for his question and, of course, acknowledge his great service to Australia and ensuring that Australians are kept safe. Mr. President, as we know, the coalition government's first priority is the security of the nation and its people, keeping Australians safe from those who seek to do us harm. ASIO and our law enforcement agencies, they are alive to the threats that our nation faces, and they work tirelessly to both detect and deter those threats on a daily basis. The national security environment in Australia is a dynamic one, and it's an ever-evolving one. And that is why the government continually reviews the legislation and the capabilities that our agencies need to detect, intercept and to respond to the emerging security needs. We have seen online radicalisation continue to evolve and become a greater security threat to Australia and to our way of life. The Director-General addressed this in his speech last night. And we know that as a result of COVID-19, this threat has continued to increase. However, we also know that as Australians, this is not the only threat that we are currently facing. We know that the pervasive threat of foreign interference is rapidly growing in both scale and in proportion. As the Director-General stated last night, foreign interference has become a principal security concern for Australia not to downplay the significance of the threat of terrorism, but it is demanding far more attention and resources. And that is why the Morrison-Joyce government have, always ensures that our national security legislation is strengthened and up to date. We've passed 27 tranches of national security legislation Minister. since 2014. Senator Mullen, a supplementary question? Uh, how is the Liberal and National Government uh, working together to strengthen our national security and combat the threat of violent extremism? Minister. Well, thank you, Senator Molan. And Australia's counter-violent extremism framework it aims to prevent people from radicalising to violent extremism, whether religiously or ideologically motivated, by delivering nationally consistent approaches to managing at-risk individuals, including those in the justice system. Just this month, the Morrison-Joyce government announced an additional $61.7 million over four years to further strengthen the counter-violent extremism efforts. This funding it includes $24.5 million to expand the CVE de-radicalisation activities, $4.7 million to build on and extend efforts to combat terrorist propaganda online, identifying extremist material for removal, and $10.7 million to a new CVE grants program that will increase awareness and build community resilience to violent Minister. extremism. Senator Mullen, a uh, second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, beyond what our agencies report in their threat assessments, are there any other risks you are aware of when considering Australia's national security? Minister. Well, Senator Molan, we're at that time of the year where we're moving towards an election. And the Australian people really do need to consider what is important to them in their federal government. What they know from the Morrison-Joyce government is we will never compromise 
on national security. We will never make apologies for keeping Australians safe. We will never make Order. apologies for putting in place Order. tough measures to ensure that the lifestyle that we have in Australia is protected. Australians need to ask themselves, given what happened under the former Rudd-Gillard Labor government, what Senator would happen Reyes. if Mr Albanese and Labor were elected to Senator office? Lines and Mr Senator President, Reyes. after 25 years in the parliament, Mr Albanese has never held a national security Order. portfolio. Never held a national port a security portfolio. Minister, minister. Actually, resonates really. Order on my left, Senator Cox. Oh no, we Sen have another change from the Greens. Yes. Senator Wish Senator Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. Th thank you, That's thank you, Chair. <laughs> my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In December last year, the Prime Minister made an unprecedented announcement of the Commonwealth's intention to refuse the application by Asset Energy to drill for oil and gas in Petroleum Exploration Permit 11 off the coast of Sydney and Newcastle. Reading directly from the PM's statement on the day, he said, this project will not proceed on our watch and this is not the right project for these communities and pristine beaches and waters. Strong statements were also made by six Liberal MPs on the day on the need to respect community wishes, protect our environment and not put our coastlines at risk. Minister, you would be aware that other communities are fighting against proposals for oil and gas drilling off their coasts, including King Island, Tasmania, off the Twelve Apostles in the Otway Basin in Victoria, Senator Thorpe's own Gunai own Ditchamara country and off the Ningaloo Reef in the Carnarvon Basin. Many of these people don't feel these are the right projects for their communities. Will you also make a political intervention to protect these communities and their environments? And if not, how is that Time. not utterly Senator, hypocritical? Senator Wish Wilson. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Um, I, uh, I thank uh, Senator Wish Wilson for uh, his. Um, Yes, indeed. Was, was there a question? But uh, I'll do my best to respond, Mr. President, to, uh, to the, um, highlight the fact around the process issues related to the PEP 11 decision um, that, uh, that was taken. And from those, uh, those process issues, I think Senator Wish Wilson will, uh, will see that some of the uh, suggestions contained, assertions contained in his question, um, are without basis. Um, uh, PEP 11 uh, was. Uh, was uh, and is regulated and decisions are made under the joint authority uh, which comprises the relevant New South Wales Minister uh, and the Commonwealth Minister uh, for Resources. Uh, that joint authority uh, approach uh, advised the PEP 11 title holder of the intent to effectively end the permit uh, by not approving the application by the title holder for a variation and suspension of the work program commitments and for an extension of the permit term. Uh, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Storage <laughs> Act sets out the process for the cancellation of a permit, uh, which oh, ensures a fair Minister, process. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. My, my question wasn't about the process, President. It was about whether the Prime Minister will now make an intervention on Senator, behalf of other communities around this Senator country Wish, that don't want oil Sen and gas drilling Senator, off their coastlines. Senator Wish Wilson, there's no point of order. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Um, well, I, I do know that, of course, nothing would uh, would give Senator Wish Wilson uh, more delight than to cancel projects right across the country. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, yes. you know, it's sort jobs. of the Greens, the Greens, the Greens cancel culture. It goes in a range of different directions, and uh, cancel projects is, of course, uh, you know, right at the top of their favourite list. And from cancel projects, they like cancel jobs, as Senator cancel Cash jobs. says. Cancel that uh, uh, cancel business, cancel outcomes for Australia, cancel growth. Cancel projects, cancel jobs. Uh, it's very much uh, the Greens' way. Uh, but the point I was making, Mr. President, uh, was that there is a process arrangement put in place in relation to how PEP 11 was considered. Uh, those processes were followed, uh, and that's how the decision was arrived at. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. On the process, President. Um, following the PM's announcement, Asset Energy and Asset, the regulator NOPTA, had formally advised him that PEP 11 permit would not be renewed and that Asset Energy had sought a review of this decision. There is no publicly available information on whether this process has been completed and a final decision made. So will your government recommit in the Senate today to the communities who fought for this decision that this project is now formally dead in the water? 
Minister. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Mr. President, uh, and, and, and thank you, uh, thank you, Senator uh, uh, Betts. Indeed, I think um, um, uh, it, uh, you were very, uh, very droll, Senator Betts. But, um, uh, Mr. President, uh, in terms of the appeal processes that may be available to Asset Energy, uh, I uh, will have to take those on notice unless I can. Uh, uh, ascertain the particularities of the status of that. Uh, I do note that uh, um, estimates are next week, and so I'm sure, in terms of the status of any such appeals, uh, that, uh, that authorities uh, appearing before estimates can probably address those questions. Uh, but, uh, but of course, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, relevant uh, local MPs, and others uh, listened very carefully to communities as well. Uh, and sought to make sure that all concerns were reflected uh, as part of the proper decision-making process. Senator Wish Wilson, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, the minister may be aware that the International Energy Agency stated last year that in order to meet our Paris commitments of 1.5 degrees warming, uh, we needed to leave all new fossil fuels in the ground and stop all new oil and gas exploration. Yet, following that report and statement, your government issued 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean exploration permits to your oil and gas donors. Are you insane? Were you willfully ignorant or simply totally corrupted and or captured by Senator the fossil Wish fuel Wilson. industry? Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Sazelja on a point of order. I don't think it's parliamentary to use uh, those kind of labels uh, and language in a question. It's not an opportunity for a rant uh, from Senator Wish Wilson, uh, and it is unparliamentary to be applying those sort of labels uh, in, a, in a question. I, I, Senator, on the point of order, Senator Wish Wilson. On the point of order, Chair, I asked a question on whether the minister's government was insane, and I don't think that's out of order. I think that's what most Senator Australians Wish feel. Wilson. In fact, that's Senator what most Wish of the Wilson. world feels when they Senator look at what Wish you're Wilson. doing to this Resume planet. Your seat. I will allow the minister to deal with the question. Um, I, I believe that, in referring to it generally towards a political party, it is not out of order. However, the minister can choose to answer the question um, as he sees fit. Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, on the question of insanity, I just wish I had brought a mirror into the chamber that I could hold up to the Australian Greens, that I could show to the Australian Greens that if you're looking uh, for insanity, the policy platform of the Australian Greens offers a perfect model of insanity, economic insanity job-destroying insanity, the type of insanity that those opposite uh, would see, of course, Australia close down industries, close down industries, prematurely lose jobs in different sectors and industries, whilst other nations would simply grow and fill that gap in different ways. Mr President, the way we are pursuing net zero and helping the world to get closer to addressing climate change is about making sure we get the technology developed in affordable ways so that other countries have affordable energy solutions. And we want Australia to be at the forefront of those affordable energy solutions, but we're not going to shut down the industries we have now while we're still in the process of supporting hydrogen and other Minister, sectors to grow Minister, and develop. That would be Minister, insanity. Your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Last week, a 79-year-old woman who had waited three and a half hours for her pain medication to be provided at the Jeddah Gardens nursing home ended up throwing herself off a third-floor balcony. She broke her leg and multiple other bones. The incident report lists neglect as a contributing factor. Only a registered nurse can deliver pain drugs, and on that day there was only one nurse rostered for more than 160 residents. Minister, all week I've been asking you about the Jetta Gardens nursing home, about which you were warned twice by your own regulator. Why are older Australians in residential aged care still being neglected by this minister in his aged care system? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And, and I am aware of reports of the um, 
serious incident that occurred at Jetta Gardens, Mr. President. Like, unlike um, Senator Watt, while the circumstances of the uh, serious incident are being uh, in investigated by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, to whom they were appropriately reported, uh, I'm not going to make judgments like Senator Watt, who's already tweeted that he thinks he knows exactly what happened and why, Mr. President. Order. Uh, well, uh, Order. Senator, Senator, Senator that's, that's, a com that's a complete Senator absurdity Watt. because, Senator because Watt. all, and I'll take the interjection, Mr. President, I'll take the injection. The, the, the Serious Incident Response Scheme, uh, introduced by this government, Mr. President, introduced by this government, uh, has been designed specifically to investigate properly serious incidents and then report them and report them publicly. So, Mr President, I reject any assertion Order. from the opposition at all that we're seeking to, uh, uh, to cover this up. We have a process, a legislative process in place that this government put in place to investigate those incidents appropriately and then report them and report them publicly, Mr President. That's what we'll do. I'm not going to presume here in this place, before the investigation has been completed and then Order. appropriately reported, as to the cause of it. Uh, in the way that Senator Watt has, Mr. President, and I think it's an absolute disgrace that he comes in here to make those sorts of assertions Order. without the appropriate, without the appropriate process to investigate what's going on, Order. Mr. President. I am as concerned as Senator Watt is about the event that Senator occurred Watt. at Jetta Gardens. I am as concerned as anybody. We all are, Mr. President. Senator those sorts Watt. of circumstances don't, should not be occurring in our aged care facilities. That's why we have over $18 billion in a five-year reform package on the table when the Labor Party has absolutely nothing. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. While this minister went to the cricket, Jetta Gardens resident Ruth was in lockdown and hadn't seen her family since December. They did not know she had COVID until she was on her deathbed and were robbed of the opportunity to spend time with her in her final days. How many neglected older Australians and their families have been robbed of their final days and moments under this minister's care? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I would point out that all residents of residential aged care in Australia are under the care of the provider, the approved provider, uh, that, uh, that where, where they are living. And of course, Mr President, uh, as I've acknowledged here before, the Australian government is responsible for the uh, approving of approved providers, and therefore, and, and also, Mr. President, the regulation uh, and, and predominantly the funding of residential aged care providers, Mr. President. Senator can I say, Mr. President, though, can I say that, in my view, in the government's view, it's been its view all through the pandemic, access to residents for visitors has something that's, is something that's been very important. It was raised by the Royal Commission in their special COVID-19 report. Uh, it was something that AHPPC put some advice out to the sector about. Uh, and, I, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, the sector has come around to the same point of view. But uh, of course, it's the actions of the opposition that is making Minister, harder for people to let people Minister, into residential aged care Your time has expired. Senator Watt, a Sup second supplementary question. The idea that this minister could blame the opposition for his problems is beyond belief, but anyway. Virginia's 85-year-old father with dementia, a Jetta Gardens resident, has COVID-19 and is locked in his room. He is disorientated and thinks he has been abandoned. The aged care home isn't communicating with his family, an aged care home this minister was warned about. How bad does the neglect of older Australians need to be before this minister resigns? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the aged care facility should be communicating with his family. That's what my expectation is, and that's the expectation uh, of of the government, Mr. President. So the aged care facility has a responsibility to communicate with Mr. President, uh, and and the regulator has taken regulatory action against the facility. Uh, and part of that process is the requirement for them to employ. Uh, as a, a special supervisor into the facility to ensure that the functions of the facility are occurring as they should be. That's been done. In fact, there's a team of people that are working in that facility to do that, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, as has been discussed in the chamber, there, is a, there are a series of regulatory actions that have been taken against this facility over the last 12 months. Uh, and, Mr. Order. President, my expectation, the government's expectation, is that the provider brings the facility 
back to compliance. That is, the, that is what the provider should do. That is what the provider should do, Mr. President. Senator and if they Watt, can't, Mr. President, Senator Pratt, the, the opportunity to remove Minister, their approved provider status Minister, actually exists. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how Australia is supporting Tonga following the recent volcanic eruption and tsunami? The Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question and for his interest uh, in the Pacific and in humanitarian relief. Uh, on the evening of Saturday, 15 January, I received a call I dread, of course, as Minister for the Pacific, news that one of our Pacific family had just suffered a devastating natural disaster. And the explosive eruption of underwater volcano uh, Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai and subsequent tsunami was declared an unprecedented disaster by Tonga's Prime Minister in the days following. At the request of the Tongan government, Australia and New Zealand coordinated closely on initial surveillance flights to provide Tonga to assess what was needed. Australian donated patrol boats and landing craft undamaged from the tsunami also went to survey the damage and evacuate people. Once the need was clear, we jumped into action. Uh, we had pre-positioned uh, supplies with the Red Cross in Tonga, which were delivered uh, immediately. Uh, we've delivered 190 tonnes of humanitarian support to date, uh, with more to come. 13 RAAF humanitarian assistance flights have landed carrying essential supplies and equipment, including food, water and shelter for families who lost their homes, medical supplies to support those who are injured, uh, and communications equipment so that friends and family in Australia and elsewhere could contact their loved ones. HMAS Adelaide arrived in Tonga on 26 January, carrying additional supplies, including equipment, to help with the clean-up and rebuilding efforts. All deliveries have been done in the COVID-safe way, in close cooperation with the Tongan government and our partners in the region. I acknowledge one of our partners in the region here, in my good friend, uh, Jelta Wong, who is with us in the gallery. Now, this support will continue for as long as it's needed. That's our commitment to our Pacific family, and they know this. They can see it in our actions. The, this government spent a record $1.76 billion in the Pacific in 2020-21. We don't just talk about support, we deliver, because that's the right thing to do for our neighbours and our family. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, how does Australia's response to disasters help to maintain security and stability in our region? Minister. Uh, well, thank you. Um, our assistance to support Tonga is consistent with what we do for our good friends across the Pacific and is not limited to a single mission. Rather, it is our enduring presence and our high quality development, policing and defence cooperation programs that has built trust over decades. Now, under the coalition, defence, stability and national security are a priority. Those opposite, unfortunately, take a different view. While under this government, our investment Order. in the region and in defence is at record highs, the Labor Party gutted the defence budget by $18 billion, the lowest level as a proportion of GDP since 1938. While we on this side take a strong stand with our partners in the region and indeed across the world, Senator Wong won't condemn the former Labor Prime Minister Keating for his appeasement on China. Now that's the contrast Order. we have in this place, Order. and we don't shy away from Senator prioritising. Watt. You know, you might not like hearing it, but that's Senator what you're going to do. That's your record: cutting defence, cutting defence in the past, Senator and you do it again. Senator Watt. Order. 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 Senator Watt. Those on my right, interjections are always disorderly. Senator Fawcett, a second supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate how security and stability in the Pacific region will be maintained in the future? Minister. Well, yes, I can. Uh, thank you. And, and the, co the coalition hold national security as our highest priority, and we've demonstrated that 
in the Pacific in a complex geostrategic environment that we will go out and support our partners in very practical ways. And as I said earlier, in contrast, uh, the Labor Party has a very different view. And the Leader of the Opposition, of course, has never held a national security role. He's never held a financial role. He's never delivered a budget. He voted to unwind our strong borders under the Rudd-Gillard government, and he has flip-flopped on everything. And now, of course, he has the Greens in his ear, holding him to ransom, demanding that he cut the defence budget in half, costing jobs Order. and harming our national security. And Australians are right. They are right to ask if they can trust those opposite with the security and the stability of our region. Now, Senator Watt might not like us highlighting these things, but these are serious questions for Australia and they are serious questions for the stability of our region. If you've got a government that doesn't Minister, care about these things, Minister, all of Minister, these things will be undermined. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. In an article entitled Yelling Out for Help, the atrocious conditions inside Australia's aged care homes, aged care worker Jess said, and I quote, one of the worst situations I saw was a lady with quite severe dementia and she was sitting in her own poo and urine, which had also gone all over the floor. It was an infection risk and a slip risk, and I was just thinking this is a expletive nightmare. What does the minister have to say to Jess? Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Firstly, I say to Jess, thank you for the work that you do in residential aged care in this country. It's really important, uh, Mr. President. I don't. I, I don't. Uh, I don't think I can count the number of times I've expressed my gratitude and thanks to the aged care workforce and appreciation for the work that they do, Mr President. Mr President, well, Order. Senator, on, on four occasions now we've provided workforce, uh, we've, we've provided bonus payments. We've provided bonus, bonus payments on four occasions now to senior Australians and, and the Labor Party chatter on about uh, a pay rise for aged care workers, uh, but they don't acknowledge that they won't put a number on it themselves. They expect that the Australian government will do it, but, but, it, but in opposition, in opposition, Mr President, they're not prepared to say or do anything. They say that it's a job for the Independent Order. Fair Work Commission that they legislate, Mr President. So there's a, there, there is so much hypocrisy on that side of the, the chamber, Mr President, in relation to this. But, Mr President, uh, I, I thank Jess for the work that she does. I really do. Uh, and I know that it's a, I know that it's a tough job, uh, and I appreciate Order. the work that she continues to do, Mr President. We will continue to work uh, with the sector. Uh, with Fair Work Australia as the case progresses in relation to workforce wages, provide the information that Fair Work Australia seeks uh, and support them in that process. Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Aged care resident Rose, who was unable to go outside for fresh air while her home was in lockdown, has said, and I quote, I think the aged care minister, Richard Colbeck, is an absolute disgrace. I mean, going to the cricket, what are his priorities and does he know what's going on? What does the minister have to say to Rose? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Um, thank, you, thank you, Rose, for your opinion. I tend to disagree. I tend to disagree. But, Mr President, of course, this is, this is the nasty personal politics that the Labor Party want to play. Uh, they're, not interested, they're not interested in actually fixing aged care. How do we know that, Mr President? Because they have no policy, Mr President. Not a single response to the Royal Commission almost a year. Almost a year. Tell Rose that, Senator Grogan. Tell Rose that almost a year after the Royal Commission has reported you don't have a response. This government has $18.3 billion on the table in response to the Royal Commission. You have nothing. Not a thing. Since the... Not, not a dollar for aged care, not Order. a mention of aged care or funding for aged care works. in any budget Order response during the term of this government, right. Mr President. Not a single dollar for aged care. And Mr President, a year, a year after the Royal Commission, no response, not a dollar, and this government Minister. has a full response, Minister. fully funded Minister. on the table. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary. 
When will this minister, who evidently doesn't wish to take any responsibility whatsoever, accept that older Australians in residential aged care are being neglected and would be safer without him as the minister? Minister. Well, Mr President, as I've just indicated, residents in residential aged care are safer with the coalition government than they are with the Labor government, because the Labor government has no policy. Has had no oh, policy no. for years. At the 2019 election, not a dollar for home care, not a, do not a dollar oh, for residential no. age, mainstream residential aged care, not a dollar for workforce, Mr. President. So they come in here with no policy over a full term of parliament, no response to the oh, Royal Commission, no, no response. Senator Almost Watt. a year after the Royal Senator Commission Keneally. has reported. We have a full response to every single recommendation of the Royal Commission. $18.3 billion on the table. And what has Labor got? Zip. Nothing. What a disgrace, Mr President. They come in here to play politics. We come in here to fix the problems of aged care. We called the Royal Commission because we knew what the issues were. And now we've responded Senator to the Royal Commission. Senator Labor Keneally. has done nothing. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Uh, further, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for is today. Leave granted. Yes. There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the, the Senate. I move the motion as circulated. Question is the Senator McKim. Apologies. Uh, thank you, President. Could I please ask that the question on uh, part three one of this motion be put separately to the rest of the motion. That is in regards to, um, in part C, the Corporations Amendment Meetings and Documents Bill 2021. Uh, and I'll just indicate that we intend to vote differently on that to all of the other bills. Okay. So we'll deal with the motion without C1. So we'll deal with everything else. Everyone clear? Then we'll put C1. Okay? Senator McKim, you're comfortable with that approach? We are, but I think Senator Griff. Well, I'm just thinking that. Senator Griff may be seeking the call. I'm just checking. Senator Griff. Uh, yes, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to move that the uh, mitochondrial donation law reform bill 2021 be added to the list of items to be considered from 4:30 p.m. at paragraph C of the motion. So Senator Griff is seeking to amend the motion. We will deal with that first. Then we will deal with the motion either as it stands or as amended. And then we will deal with the inclusion of section C1. Everyone comfortable with that? Sorry, Senator Gallagher, are you uh, seeking the call? Yes, please, Mr President. I just want to, um, on Senator Griff's amendment, just to explain that we will not be supporting that. Uh, Maeve's law is subject to a conscience vote um, across the Labor Party and in line with that decision, we do not support guillotines or time management motions on that um, legislation that's subject to conscience votes. All right, so if everyone, Senator Birmingham. And uh, Mr. President, just for clarity, uh, uh, the government uh, echoes um, the position just put by Senator Gallagher that uh, much as I would like to see debate on Maves Law concluded and, uh, and have tried to facilitate through this motion additional time, we won't be applying the guillotine uh, to its consideration. All right, so we'll start with Senator Griff's amendment to the motion. Those in favour of Senator Griff's amendment say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. I, I only heard one voice. I'll put the question again. Those in favour of the amendment say aye. 
Those against say no, I did not hear a voice for eyes. The noes have it. The noes have it. So I will now put the rest of the amendment, not including subsection C1, then we'll vote on C1 last. So I'll put the motion without subsection C1. Those in favour of that uh, motion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we will vote on the inclusion of C1. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. everything. <laughs>
Stop the bells. Question is regarding the inclusion of item C1. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Davey, teller for the eyes, and Senator McKim, teller for the nose. There being 41 ayes, 9 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. We will now... Senator Colbeck, are you seeking the call? I am, President. Thank you, President. I just uh, tabled data that was sought by Senator Shelton in his question today. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. We will now move briefly to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers, I'll give. I, I'll, don't need to run, Senator Pratt. I'll give you some time. I'll uh, allow the deputy president to step in. That can go. Yep. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note. Actually, I know you don't like to be called Madam, so I will just call you Deputy President. Um, I take note of answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Sheldon, Wash, Walsh, Watt uh, and Grogan. As we have seen in question time after question time, our minister, National Minister for Aged Care and Seniors, Senator Colbeck, refuses to take any responsibility for the dire plight of senior Australians trapped in aged care in appalling circumstances. Incident after incident, it is leaving my home state of WA incredibly scared of what it might mean for our state when and if COVID uh, actually arrives in the state. We have seen from this minister such abject unaccountability, it beggars belief. We saw the minister in question time today simply point the finger back at the dysfunctional companies that are failing to uphold standards. He is responsible for the regulator. The government is responsible for aged care. And he simply pointed the finger back at the Jeddah Aged Care Home. He says, well, it's their responsibility to improve their standards. Well, sure it is, but look how dysfunctional it is. Look at the abject lack of care we have 
senior Australians in pain with injuries, jumping out of windows and breaking their legs because there is only one nurse there to administer pain medication. Is it little wonder that this poor woman was left for three and a half hours? Is it any wonder that she threw herself uh, off a third floor balcony and broke her bones in multiple places? And the incident report demonstrates that neglect is a contributing factor. This is the minister that has refused to allow aged care workers and pensioners keep up with the cost of living, refusing to acknowledge the impact of the high rate of CPI here in Australia, the high rate of that consumer price index inflation and the impact that it has on pensioners and indeed aged care workers who in some cases uh, might earn, say, as little as $1,400 a week. It is utterly appalling. We have here, uh, in this government, a, a government that refuses to take responsibility for the plight of people in aged care. At Jetta Gardens, which was talked about in question time today, one resident has been not locked in their room, 85 years old with dementia. He's disorientated and legitimately he thinks he has been abandoned and the aged care home has not been communicating with his family. Jetta Gardens uh, resident Ruth hadn't seen her family since December. Her family didn't know she had COVID until she was on her deathbed. And they were robbed of the opportunity to spend time with her in her final days. I cannot begin to imagine what is going on on the front line and how upset not only families residents, but also how upset staff are who are doing this work in our aged care facility homes right around Australia and doing it with inadequate wages, absolutely inadequate wages, inadequate wages that, according to the Aged Care Royal Commission, contribute to the lack of staff you, and the lack Pratt, of retention of staff. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, um, Deputy President. And uh, look, I, I thank Senator Pratt for raising this very important issue, um, the issue of, of aged care and our government's commitment to aged care. Senator Pratt said our government refuses to address the issues in aged care, which is patently wrong. It was our government that commissioned, uh, set up the Aged Care Royal Commission. It's our government that accepted the report, the final report of the Royal Commission, which had 148 recommendations. Our government that has accepted or accepted in principle 142 of the 148 recommendations. Our government that as at January 2022, 135 of those recommendations are being addressed, either wholly or in part. We have already implemented measures within the aged care reform package in the 2021-22 budget context and subsequently through the MyEFO process. We have a five-year implementation plan, plan underpinned by five pillars. We are improving the home care packages which supports our senior Australians who choose to remain in their home. And we know that so many of our senior Australians want that choice. They want to be able to stay at home, retain their dignity, be close to their friends and their family. We are improving and simplifying residential aged care services and access so that 
For those who have to go into a res residential aged care facility, it is easier to access. We are improving the quality and safety monitoring of aged care facilities, and we are supporting growing a better skilled workforce. We have measures in place, and we're improving. We've got new legislation for stronger governance principles through that process. We know that throughout COVID, our aged care workers have gone above and beyond their usual requirements. We know that the aged care workforce has been front and centre under the spotlight during this pandemic. And we know that the aged care facilities, the aged care environment is very vulnerable to the various waves of COVID. But that's why, instead of refusing to address it, as Senator Pratt has alleged, from the outset, we have put in place measures to help our aged care um, community respond to the challenges that COVID puts in front of us. We have, since August last year, we had rapid antigen tests at point of care being used within aged care facilities, first as a trial and then we rolled it out more broadly. And that underpinned the process to then move to rapid antigen tests at home. From our national medical stockpile, we made sure that there were masks, gowns, gloves, goggles, face shields, hand sanitizer, and other PPE provided to the aged care sector facilities. Our Defence Force is providing strategic logical support to the aged care se sector. And we, from the very outset, from the first case of COVID in an aged care facility, <coughs> We set up a surge workforce, which has to date facilitated more than 80,000 shifts filled by this surge workforce when our aged care staff have been uh, isolated due to COVID or being a close contact. 100 per cent of our aged care facilities across the country have received a booster clinic. More than 76 per cent of eligible aged care residents have now received their booster shot. So we have remained flexible and adaptive throughout COVID while still remaining focused on our commitment and our response to the Royal, Royal, Aged Care Royal Commission. This government is delivering once in a generation change through our response to the Royal Commission through $18.3 billion of support for aged care sector reform. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davy. Senator McCarthy. Deputy President, I rise to take note of questions asked by Senator Sheldon, Walsh, Watt and Grogan to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services. And it's interesting listening to uh, the previous senator speak about the Royal Commission uh, that um, there seems to be always a lapse in memory that uh, the only reason the Royal Commission into Aged Care came about was because of the pressure that was applied onto this government time and time again by those of us on this side of the chamber. It was a Royal Commission that you did not wish to take part in or even to establish until there was political pressure to do the right thing. And that's the same in this context as well. We shouldn't be surprised that this minister cannot answer a basic question about the impact of the cost of living increases on senior Australians. This is, after all, a minister who'd rather be at the cricket than working on solving the crises in his portfolio, the crisis affecting our elders, our parents and grandparents. The Australian Bureau of Statistics published back on 2 February that aged pensioners are experiencing higher cost of living increases. More than a week ago, the ABS published its findings that annual increases in living costs range between 2.6 per cent for employee households and 3.4 per cent for aged pensioner households in the December quarter, and food makes up a high proportion of overall expenditure especially for our elders. 
And what we have consistently said in this chamber time and time again is take accountability, take responsibility. This minister has failed time and time again to do any of those things. People have died under his watch, hundreds of people. His inability to stand before this Senate and to face that accountability is reprehensible. He should resign. There are people in the Northern Territory who still, in our communities, do not have the rats that they should have. Our aged care centres do not have the resourcing that they should have in terms of staffing. Our elders across those regions need this parliament to do the right thing in protecting and caring for the vulnerable. You said you would, from day one, care for the vulnerable in our country. And you have failed, totally failed. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. The time for this debate has expired. I'll just put the motion as moved by Senator Pratt to take note of answers. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk.